Hello, V here, and welcome back to biology. We are embarking on a new unit today, evolution. We'll be looking at the ways in which life has changed here on planet Earth, and why it has changed the way it has. We'll be looking at changes that happen on a large scale to whole populations and species over long periods of time. How long do you consider to be a long time? You may have thought an hour, or a year, or maybe even a whole century. But in terms of geology and evolution, even a century can be meaningless. We'll be looking at spans of time that last millions or even billions of years. This is because the Earth is old. Very, very old. Four and a half billion years old to be exact. That's a lot of time for tiny, seemingly insignificant changes to add up and not seem so tiny anymore. Before we get started, let's look at our goals for this lesson. By the end, you'll be able to define evolution, explain why beneficial adaptations can increase in a population, and give examples of adaptations. We said earlier that our new unit will focus on evolution. Do you know what the word evolution means? The simplest definition is change. Specifically, in science, evolution usually refers to the changes that have occurred in the diversity and complexity of life on Earth throughout its long history. What kind of organisms do you think evolved first on Earth? Remember way back in our cells unit, we learned about prokaryotic cells. These were the small, simple cells that don't have a nucleus or other organelles. In nature, we tend to find that things start simple and become more complex over time. So it makes sense that prokaryotic cells evolved first, and eventually some diversified into the more complex eukaryotic cells that make up me and you. But how do small, simple organisms evolve into large, complex organisms? It seems almost impossible. But there is one ingredient that life on Earth has had that made it very possible. Time. How old did we say the Earth is? Four and a half billion years. Small changes, generation after generation, accumulate, and the possibilities for diversification and complexity become nearly endless. We'll find as we go through the unit that most of these changes are not random, at least not the changes that stick around. Changes that give organisms any kind of advantage over other organisms tend to get passed on more frequently than changes that were less helpful. Any idea why? We know that many traits are controlled by genes, and that genes are passed from parent to offspring. If an organism is lucky enough to be born with a trait that makes them more successful, there's a good chance they'll live longer. And for many organisms, living longer means reproducing more. Reproducing more means more chances for that successful trait to be passed on. It takes many, many generations to see the effect of this happening in a population, but Earth has all the time in the world, and eventually, these changes are inevitable. Back in Unit 1, you may remember learning about adaptations. These are helpful traits that make an organism more likely to survive and reproduce in their environment. And as we just explained, Organisms with these helpful traits will likely live longer and pass the helpful traits on to their offspring. Let's look at some fascinating examples of adaptations in the natural world. Quick quiz. Do you know what animal this is? You might first be tempted to say lizard, but it's actually a salamander. Salamanders are amphibians, so while they live primarily on land, they do need to lay their eggs in or near water. Perhaps the most interesting fact about salamanders is their ability to regenerate. This means that if a salamander loses a leg, no worries, they can simply grow it back. 
This is obviously a very advantageous adaptation for salamanders. Imagine, a salamander has just been caught by a turtle, one of their common predators. Chances are, the turtle snatched our little friend here by its leg. For most animals, this is a death sentence and a yummy snack for the turtle. But salamanders' legs actually separate from their bodies pretty easily, so the salamander can simply leave it behind and live to see another day. Of course, without the ability to grow the leg back, the salamander probably wouldn't have many days left anyway. But because of their adaptation, within a month or so, they'll be as good as new again. Humans don't have the ability to grow legs back, unfortunately, but we have come a long way with artificial prosthetics, which can replace limbs that are lost. Perhaps one of our most important adaptations is the ability to manipulate technology to make up for what our biological bodies can't do. Another useful adaptation is found in the monarch butterfly. You may be used to animals that use camouflage, blending into their surroundings so that predators can't see them. But the monarch butterfly doesn't have to bother with that. Its bright orange color is a signal to predators that they are poisonous. Animals that ingest monarch butterflies become sick and can even die. Being poisonous is the monarch butterfly's adaptation, and most animals have evolved to know that they are poisonous based on their color. This is a common trend in the animal kingdom. Bright colors often indicate species which are toxic in some form. This is the only reason they survive, even though they stand out so easily. You don't have to bother hiding if would-be predators know better than to make you their lunch. But the story doesn't end here. Being poisonous is an adaptation for monarch butterflies. But another species of butterfly, the viceroy butterflies, have very similar coloration. So they must be poisonous too, right? Nope. Viceroy butterflies are perfectly safe to eat for most predators, but they rarely get eaten. Could you tell the difference between these two butterflies? Enough to know for sure which was safe to eat? Probably not. Neither can most of their predators. So the adaptation for viceroy butterflies is not that they are poisonous, but that they look like a butterfly that is. This type of adaptation is called mimicry, and there are many other examples of it in the animal kingdom. Why do you think adaptations such as these arise in populations? Why would salamanders evolve to have legs that can easily come off then grow back? Why would monarch butterflies evolve to be poisonous to predators? And why would viceroy butterflies evolve to look almost identical to monarch butterflies? It has to do with that fundamental rule we mentioned earlier. Traits that are advantageous, such as these, make the organism more likely to survive. And if they survive, there's a good chance they'll pass it on to their offspring. Eventually, most of the population has the beneficial trait because those that didn't, didn't survive long enough to reproduce. This process is called natural selection, and we'll learn more about it in a later lesson. But where did these helpful traits come from the first time? Remember from a couple units back, we learned about mutations. All adaptations initially arise from mutations. Mutations which are harmful don't tend to get passed on if they put the organism at a disadvantage. But if a random mutation happens to be helpful instead, it may get passed on in large numbers and eventually become the most predominant trait in the species. We'll see lots of other examples of adaptations as we go through the unit. Can you think of any other adaptations in animals or even plants that you see around us? Remember that to be an adaptation, it has to meet two criteria. It has to be a trait which can be passed to offspring, and it has to make the organism more likely to survive and reproduce. As we went through the lesson today, we considered the age of the Earth and how this long time span allows small changes to gradually build up, making big changes to the life that exists here on our home planet. We also looked at examples of adaptations and thought about how these adaptations may have arisen. 
As we go through the unit, be sure to fill out the lesson notes in the PDF and complete the other activities found there. You will need the information in the PDF to successfully complete the lesson assessment. As always, the PDF pages for the entire unit are attached to this lesson, and you'll also find the PDFs for individual lessons after each video. Next time, we'll get started on our journey by learning about an actual journey by a scientist who is credited with discovering much of what we know about evolution. Until then, remember that biology isn't just science, it's the way of life. Hey, hey.